voice is being picked yeah, up. Yeah, picked up, yeah. And that mic is just really good. This is a Okay, uh, hi everybody. This is uh, a recording for Friday's uh, lecture in powders, powder technology. What is this, 470 in chemical engineering or 670 in engineering? Uh, Friday's lecture is going to be, for now on going forward, it's going to be taped uh, on uh, different subjects, different from uh, Monday and Wednesday subjects. So this subject is entirely new uh, for us. It is uh, paste and high viscosity processing. Right. We look uh, excellent books in this area. Uh, we got McCabe and Smith and Harriet, excellent textbook. And we have my books that are written, fluid mixing, gas dispersion, scale-up and design of industrial mixing processes. And the third book, process scale-up and design. And the fourth book is business, business of scale-up. All these books are available on Amazon.com. They make excellent Christmas gifts. They're expensive. They're inexpensive. They're cheap, and uh, I'm not making any money on them much. About a couple thousand a year, maybe. Not even that. They're uh, meant to uh, help people out. Very few people really understand the uh, scale up or all the subtleties of scale up which is the book number three, very important, nice book. Anyway, let's just talk about uh, general processing aspects of paste and high viscosity liquids. First, we should recognize there's a division here between uh, viscous liquids and pastes, okay? Now, viscous liquids, the material flows, well, obviously, but very slowly. These types of fluids will obey the no-slip condition of fluid mechanics. They will adhere to the wall. Okay. Pastes, however, can very easily uh, not flow. They can very easily have substantial slippage between the impeller and does not coat or adhere to the wall. And the material is not pulled to behind the impeller blade. So uh, you can have honey, which would be viscous liquid, or you can then have bread dough, which would be more of a paste. Obviously, the bread dough will flow, but it also bread dough also has a yield point. You can just sit there. Lots of money in high viscosity materials. And what we're interested in, we're interested in different geometries, different levels of power input. We're interested in the flow fields. We're interested in rheologies, circulation and processing times. How long does it take you to make bread dough? That's going to be one of the questions we would be interested in. Pastes, uh, again, the agitator material must meet there's very little pumping, there's very little velocities involved, it's all impeller blade. Uh, the agitator or blade must pass through all parts of the vessel or all parts of the fluid. And the machinery usually develops very large forces, large torque. They're regularly built and high-end power input. Example piece of this type of machinery would be put, trying to put carbon black into rubber and uh, substantial power input. Banbury mixer would be a typical device. Since there's such a high power input, the material will get hot. There will be a temperature rise due to the frictional forces in the fluid. And cooling is often necessary. What we're interested in is mixing, of course, and we sort of better define what mixing is so we have a better idea of what's going on. Well, you can look at mixing as the breakup of large 
globs of material to smaller globs of material. So if I go along there, I'm going from very thick material to very thin material. And this would be the size of the separation, right? This is pure, pure, pure. No interactions by diffusion. On the other hand, if we now mix this direction vertically downward here, we change the intensity of segregation. The idea being that we have more and more diffusion acting, and uh, in the mixing process we go from separated large globules of material down to very small material, globules of material with the interface fairly poorly defined. And that would be uh, the definition of what we're trying to do when we're mixing two materials. So, uh, scale means size, and so the size of the segregation. We have two different things, we have two different concepts. The scale of segregation would be a size measurement, and the intensity of segregation would be the indication of diffusion acting. You have both diffusion and size scale reduction going on. So you see a scale of segregation of the size of the unmixed regions, the intensity is measured, purity of segregation, diffusion usually occurs. And so SI, the intensity of segregation, measures how much diffusion has occurred. High quantities of mixtures have small scale and low intense high quality mixtures will have a small scale and very low segregation. Everything's broken up and the fusion is well on its way. Again, giving you the idea of the process of mixing. Now if we get particular here and start doing, doing some data, it's very odd that the size of the segregation, okay, of these big globs of unmixed material turns out to be a function of revolutions down here, number of revolutions. So we may have measures of the scale minus 10, uh, 10, 10 to the minus 1, 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 3, and we have some sort of inner outer radius, some sort of mixer. But we see that as we increase the number of revolutions to the material, as experienced, we uh, reduce down the scale of segregation if it's an excellent, uh, if it's a good mixer or effective mixer. The same thing with intensity of segregation. If we would study the intensity of segregation, we would find that it too is also a function of the number of revolutions to mix. Here, uh, N would be RPM and theta m would be mixing time. So when we multiply revolutions per time, times time, we run up with the number of revolutions to mix. Going forward, you'll find that if you work for a pharmaceutical company or, well, drug company or any sort of company that requires federal uh, registration as in the Food and Drug Administration, then uh, there are processes, any sort of contacting processes, such as mixing, will, you will probably have to report the number of revolutions the material has experienced. If you go into the lab and you talk to the lab chemists, they'll always quote you time. The reaction time was this, the reaction time was that. Or you talk to processing people out in the plant, and they'll say processing's done in 15 minutes or whatever time is there. But that's the end. It's not a very good way of looking at things. Time is uh, fairly worthless, actually. What you need to do is talk in terms of how many revolutions the material has experienced. Revolutions indicate uh, what the material has experienced mechanically. Right. And you all know, as students, if I take an ordinary student, he comes in, promptly falls asleep, and 
and when the lecture is over, he wakes up and walks out. So the student has spent maybe 50 minutes in the lecture sleeping and uh, not at all participating in uh, taking notes and learning. So his residence time or time for the student in the classroom, it, it, is, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. He hasn't done anything. He's slept through it all. And uh, as a result, when you say the student spent 50 minutes in a classroom and did nothing, and actually it's a fairly worthless uh, concept time and uh, doesn't tell you anything that the process has actually experienced. Okay, so what you need to somehow do is make sure the student comes to class, participates in the discussions, interacts with the lecturer, professor, and taking notes, and that would be essentially effective. That would be an effective process. So in mixing, it's the same thing. You have situations where there's ineffective mixing, nothing's getting done, or effective mixing where things are taking place. The mixture itself is kind of interesting. Uh, usually, uh, one thinks of putting cream into coffee. If you put cream into coffee, you'll get a uniform mixture, and it's uniform all the way down to the molecular level. However, in lots and lots of processes, that doesn't happen, for example. And you have regions of high, or you have regions of varying concentrations. For example, if I take a look at this here, down here, I have a big patch of stuff. And uh, on a gross vision of it, uh, looking at the big block here, I see that I could probably say that it's well mixed. However, if I look very small here at this one block in here, I'll notice that uh, it's fairly unmixed. In other words, I have a region of uh, clear and I have a region of uh, this, the dots. So uh, I have to worry about the size of examination that I'm concerned about, or I'm looking for the scale of scrutiny here. For example, if I have cat feet, I mean, I got a cat, right, and you're going to feed it pellets. And the pellets are blue and yellow and green and red, and the cat eats them all because they all taste the same. Maybe cats are colorblind anyway. Not sure about that. But, <clears throat> see, you'll never be able in cat food, in this type of cat food, to mix the green and the red together because they're in different pellets. Now, you can mix red pellets with green pellets, with orange pellets and blue pellets and whatnot. By getting down, you can still separate all the blues from all the reds, right? Anyway, so you have this scale of scrutiny, and this actually needs to be specified whenever you're talking about a product. And uh, there's not everything that goes down to the molecular level. Right? Lots and lots of powders do not go down to the molecular level. Anything with solids, solids have any in a trace, are not mixed at the molecular level. One of the reasons why solids differ greatly from liquids and gases is because they do not mix down to the molecular level. There's always going to be some sort of crystal or grain size. So we have this slide is meant to demonstrate the scale of scrutiny. If I look really, really small, I'm unmixed. I look really, really large, I am mixed. So the scale of scrutiny is often the size of the sample being examined. The smaller the sample, the more unmixed it is. A single powder particle is unmixed. And again, scale of scrutiny. SOS is determined by product specification, what the customer wants. And the size level uh, where the product fills the process specifications. Above the SOS, the product is considered mixed. Below SOS, the product is more and more unmixed. Canned cat food pellets, SOS is, by the way, is not clearly understood by most people and not recognized as being important. 
but it should be specified in the product specifications. Uniformity are implicitly or explicitly stated in product specifications. Product specifications, by the way, uh, range from being clearly understood, clearly stated, to uh, being implied and not stated, uh, to being not understood at all. Uh, scale of segregation is not all that important if the uh, sense of processing is, is easy, or is it, right? Overprocessing is commonly accepted and is often a complete waste of time, and you're losing money, by the way. One case in point is that you know, out in the consulting world, I ran across the company 18 hour cycle time for their processing. And essentially, they, the process, the procedure, made a mistake and then corrected for the mistake. Okay. And so they had mixed times on the order of 12 hours, right? Whereas in the mixing, you should think of, again, 30 revolutions. And if I'm going around at 30 RPM, perhaps, I will mix in a minute. So here you have processing going on for 12 hours. If you did the process correctly, you could have mixing done in maybe a couple minutes. And as a result, your production levels can go up significantly. Eventually, we reduced the 12-hour cycle down, down half an hour. This was a high-value material for the company involved. And obviously their production went through the roof. Their profits did it as well. Processing is poorly understood. The losses are just accepted, right? Losses are just accepted. People don't realize that the product is off spec, so they simply mix it until it's on spec. That's not a very good way of operating, by the way. So processing quantities, mixture generally has a mean value and a standard deviation. Poor quality has large deviations of mean value. Standard deviations to measure how far the individual values are away from uh, the mean or average value. You yeah, have to talk about the variance and the product specification should include processing quality measures and how these should be measured. These are often process specific. Mean and standard deviations are sufficient to characterize most mixtures. And then you might get into the F test, chi squared, for the student T tests to compare mixing. Always did like these uh, statistical tests. Although I uh, somewhat, you always have to be a little skeptical of them. They're based upon standard distribution, Gaussian distribution. These uh, tests are used to compare sample values and that of a perfectly mixed system. The, dis the difference is noted the mixture is not perfectly mixed. Right? Limitation of the test is they assume a normal distribution, and many processes are not normally distributed. Particle systems typically are not normally distributed. Liquids. Now, what we were shooting at earlier was just the mixtures in general. This uh, narrowed it down to more specific items. Uh, in particular, we're lurking for viscous liquids like honey and under laminar flow or creeping flow conditions. It's probably better to call it creeping flow, very slow velocities. The first thing you want to recognize is uh, what the power input mechanism is. Power is energy per time, and it makes things happen, basically. Uh, for these viscous systems, power can be very high. In fact, it can literally cause the material to catch fire. <laughs> You're mixing something, and suddenly it catches fire. From a point of view of a mechanical agitator, power is equal to some constant viscosity, rotational speed squared, and a diameter cubed. That's for uh, some sort of impeller going at certain RPM. And you see viscosity is extremely important. Here, you do not see density at all. 
Or if we have a flowing system, for example, going through a static mixer uh, or an inline mixer, you have the flow rate times the pressure drop, right, would give you a power measurement. Other methods for processing tend to be not as significant. For example, jet mixing doesn't happen very much. In fact, it does not happen at all. And laminar mixing. Gas dispersion, if you try to bubble gas through a very thick milkshake, you get the sensation that gas barging is not a very good mixer. Same thing for boiling. If I boil water on the stove, it's well mixed, but that's turbulent. However, if I try to boil pudding on the stove, then I'm in a situation where I have high viscosities and the pudding is definitely uh, not going to be mixed by the boiling. We can have sprays, but uh, again, if you have difficulty of actually forming droplets of very thick material. These all tend to be very important in turbulent flow. However, in laminar flow, they tend to, or creeping flow conditions, they tend to be unimportant. So, power from a mixer is typically what's necessary. And we're in the Stokes drag regime. There's little changes in velocity magnitude. And this is a breakdown to explain drag a little bit better. Drag is proportional, drag force. Drag is a force. And when I say drag force, it's sort of like saying force, force. But anyway, I have uh, force, this drag force is viscosity times some sort of velocity, some sort of a length scale involved, that would be a force. Force times velocity, and the velocity would be some sort of rotational speed, diameter. So I would wind up that the power would be viscosity divided, by, excuse me, viscosity times rotational speed squared and uh, diameter cubed. See, this up here becomes, this velocity here becomes N, D. So this is really viscosity N, D squared times this quantity, which is nv, and I get n squared d cubed, and I have the laminar power number. Now, this power number is not really recognized. Everybody is fairly unskilled in this area, I would have to say. So power numbers like the drag coefficient for the impeller, what affects drag, affects power draw as well. Now, lots of people tell me that's wrong. It's unfortunate all the people that are wrong in the world. What affects power? Well, it's what affects uh, what affects drag. So you got density now, impeller diameter, yes. Blade width, yes, although it's not been stated. Blade number, yes. The belly length, yes. Height away from the impeller, probably not. And so on, you have a bunch of yeses and a bunch of noes. Shear rates in laminar processing can be very important as well. We have uh, baffles, right, or place, plates placed in the flow to redirect the flow. Very useful in turbulent flow, not useful at all in laminar flow. It's not, it's not uncommon for people to think, oh, they used it in turbulent flow, so they have to use it in laminar flow. The two regimes are completely different from each other. And laminar flow, creeping flow, the baffles are not used and really aren't very, are not needed. They can cause dead zones and significant cleaning issues. So it's not a good idea to have them around. Not needed or desired. Shock, shock of all shocks. Baffles in laminar flow are a problem. Now then, this is a very interesting plot, a uh, fantastic plot by some Japanese. I, oh, Peterson Smith, oh yeah, back in 67. Anyway, what you have is a rotating impeller. Right here is the rotating impeller. See the rotating impeller up here? You have Reynolds number 1, 10, and 50. And where you see is where the shear rates are. Shear rates. You see there's substantial shear rates between the impeller and the wall, and substantial shear rates on the inside of the blade, some to some length in here. And then you see mostly a dead region for the rest of the thing. 
So it's interesting to note for laminar processing, creeping flow processing, that the rest of the tank is fairly stagnant. The most of the action is around the impeller blade. Now, why would you care? Well, you could possibly feed right above this rotating impeller. You could feed right in this region here. That way it will get quickly mixed in because this is the region where most of the action is occurring and you have mixing. Reynolds number, for to calculate. Below a, thousand, below a thousand should be laminar or creeping flow. The problem with Reynolds number is it has this plenity here called viscosity. And it's not very accurate if viscosity is not known. Right. Viscosity is often thought of as a fluid property, but indeed it's more of a property of flow field and the material. So it's a sort of a mixed property. It's both the laminar, excuse me, it's both the fluid property and not a fluid property, but a function of flow field. Now, the classic mistake in uh, this type of processing, laminar flow or viscous processing, is the use of turbulent mixers in the laminar applications. Now, we'll give that a name. That's the Roman Haas mistake. I mean, they were always trying to squeak by with turbulent mixers in a laminar application. Usually gave them very poor results. And it also justified their existence for a job. Anyway, just if they have processing problems, they have reasons for employment. So I don't know which came first, bad processing, then the job, or the job, and then bad processing. Rheology. Uh, rheology is the science of how material deforms. Right? Most important quantity is viscosity, and as I said earlier, sometimes a fluid property, so, sometimes a flow field, often both. There's all kinds of uh, viscosity materials out there. This is kind of a very simple graph showing you shear stress versus shear rate. Now there's two types of stresses, normal stresses and shear stresses. And we're primarily focused on shear stresses. And the first one that pops up here at the top is a Bingham plastic. And a Bingham plastic were quite common. Yogurt's a Bingham plastic. Paint is a Bingham plastic. Something that has potentially a structure to it, and as it flows, it will break down. So it's potentially possible to have a shear thinning Bingham plastic or a shear thickening Bingham plastic. Then we also have our Newtonian, and then we have our shear thinning fluids, and then we have our shear thickening fluids. Shear thinning fluids are quite common. Bingham plastics tend to be quite common. Shear thickening fluids are not so common, and uh, Newtonian are, are pretty much everywhere. The important quantity for Bingham plastic is not the viscosity. You're not really interested necessarily in the viscosity here. What you're interested in is the yield point, the point at which it begins to flow. You got to make sure that you get above that. And then you become interested in the viscosity. Viscosity is above uh, 5,000 or 500 centipoids are likely to be non-Newtonian. Newtonian fluids are typically low viscosity. Plastic viscosity is less important. The problem is the, to determine the break point or the, to break the yield point. Once the fluid moves, there is usually no problem. Power is the same as the other fluid types above the yield point. Big power is startup torque. Startup torque could be either quite big. So we have going forward, uh, we could potentially have a laminar power power number and a turbulent power number. And you gotta watch out, they're related here. The laminar power number equals the Reynolds number times the turbulent power number. And then we have the headstrong number. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing the German, which has the yield point density, some sort of length scale squared, usually a diameter, divided by this plastic viscosity. That's the headstrong number. And these are various plots of uh, power numbers. And there's 
turbulent power numbers. And here you can see torque as a function of blade number. Right? So the Bingham plastic sits from one from zero to five or ten here, right? Zero to five. The fluid, the blades are buried in thick fluid as the yoke point and are not moving. Up here the fluid begins to move and so the torque remains constant. This is uh, what happens when you have a six blade turbine. This is 1970s from Nagata. You have the uh, typical power number curve, which is the headstrong number equaling zero. So it falls right around in here. But as you increase the headstrong number, you're basically increasing the yield point. And you're going more and more Bingham plastic type. And where this line comes down and intersects the horizontal line is basically a mixing switch. Above this point, let's take this black dots here, above this point, above 500, here everything will be fine. Below 500, this material will set up. Most of the tank will be essentially unaffected by the impeller. So you have an assignment I want you to do around Christmas time or holiday times, I should say, or around Thanksgiving or other holiday times, I want you to mix some whipped cream. As you mix the whipped cream, you'll notice that you're using a turbulent mixer and a laminar application. So you got to go into a rotational mode or a planetary mode where the mixer is moving in the, the pan that's holding the whipped cream. And as the whipped cream uh, sets up, from cream to whipped cream, they'll set up as a Bingham plastic with a yield point. So you, if you locate the impeller in one region of the tank, you will see the other region of the tank is unmixed. And this is what we'll have in this region here. We'll have an unmixed region. If the Reynolds number gets high enough, we'll have the whole, the whole process being mixed. Now, you can see that down in this graph, we have the helical ribbon again from the Kata 1970s, 1970. The helical ribbon is an impeller that goes throughout the entire tank. And as a result, you don't uh, necessarily have problems. The up point that determines processing difficulty, right? Material will not flow at low shear rates, can't be processed below the yield point. Lumps will appear, making processing difficult. Potentially, you could have a false body where you have two viscosity levels, one at the higher, one at the low shear rates. It appears to be a solid, will deform, and can be processed eventually over time. Lumps appear. I don't know if you've uh, stirred up yogurt before, but as you're taking yogurt and uh, going to eat it, you may mix a portion of it. By the other portion, because I'm mixed, and they actually form these big and plastic lumps in the fluid. Viscoelastic fluids, all bets are off, right? Geology is complex. You have both viscous and elastic at the same time. Examples are egg whites, nasal fluid, sticky uh, fluids, anything that forms a string or strings, cotton candy maybe, although I'm not sure cotton candy is a fluid. Uh, fluids may appear homogeneous, but structurally heterogeneous. You take egg whites, the egg white uncooked, right, it looks clear, it looks like it uniform, but inside an egg white, there's the fluid part, and then there's a structural part. And this plays havoc with processing. You usually uh, have difficulty mixing egg whites. Difficult to mix because of elastic properties. Fluid may be appearing heterogeneous, but homogeneous, but actually is heterogeneous. Why study these? Well, lots and lots of processes are viscoelastic. And as a result, uh, they cause processing problems. Processing is going to harm the elasticity and usually destroys the elasticity, yes. 
mechanical mixing can change chemistry. You can denature proteins that way. You take egg whites and beat it enough, you will have cream meringue. Anyway, so you can have situations where processing, mechanical processing changes the chemistry. It's something to watch out for. And nobody's ever learned that. Well, it's not commonly taught in universities because we have to deal with the low level general areas rather than more specific areas. It's an example of processing out in the real world where phenomena that you don't understand occurs. And the more you understand the phenomena, the better off you are. Radiological data are needed under conditions occurring in manufacturing under the shear stress and normal stress deformation rates that occur in the process. Processes have certain shear rates, processes have certain normal rate rates. So you need, uh, for normal stresses, you need to understand where those occur and the rheology of where those occur. Typically, if we go and look at power correlations, one of the obvious, one of the reasons why you have to worry about power is you probably have to size the motor to mix the equipment. Now, viscosity can be extremely high, and as a result, your power input to the material is going to get hot. It's an indication of substantial power going to the material. Oh, yeah, you have a power number times Reynolds number basically equal to a constant. It's really not a constant. It's a function of geometry, usually half of the has to be determined experimentally. And it floats around 100, 300. Typical values range from 20, 4,000. As I said earlier, putting carbon into rubber is not easy. You're going to have very high uh, values for the B. And colors and tight geometries can become quite complex. You can have helical ribbons, screw and fellers, sigma mixers. And the famous the rollers, and one of the famous rollers is what is called the three roll mill, which is an extraordinary piece of equipment. Do not get caught near a three roll mill where it takes a snatch at you, because then you will uh, have bad experience while you die. Anyway, gives a point here you should be very careful about everything you do because nature as I often say, as a habit of reaching out and killing you. But getting back, we want the impeller to bring motion to the entire tank. And if you take a look at extruders, they're very common. They're just screw impellers in a pipe. Turtle mixers and laminar processing only acceptable if in planetary motion, covering the whole tank. So I get on the, uh, YouTube, type in planetary mixers, and see what you come up with. Power is an integral quantity. It's drawn from the impeller and consumed in the fluid. It's not necessary to calculate from details. Obviously, power has the fundamental units of viscosity, rotational speed, cubed length scale. Excuse me, rotational speed squared, length scale cubed. There's some uh, more of this laminar flow. Two power numbers, you gotta watch out what you're talking about. One of the cool things about viscosity is that usually you don't know it. And or you have suspect data. And what you can do is you can turn your processing equipment. This is very valuable. This is this is a very valuable piece of knowledge here. You can make a lot of money on using this. So I hope you Wake up a little bit and pay attention because uh, we're talking money here. Uh, we're not talking science. We're not talking even engineering. We're talking about measuring power, excuse me, measuring viscosity online. First, uh, you need to, there's a procedure for this. First, you calibrate your machine. In other words, you measure the power, you measure viscosity, or you know the viscosity from a known value, you pick a rotational speed and a diameter, and you measure power, and you calculate the NP, N subscript P. That's the power number. 
you run empty, you run full, check the difference, that's the power delivered to your material with any mill and viscosity. Since you've back calculated the power number here, you now have your systems calibrated. Next, you turn on your equipment and run it on your material and you measure power. You are assuming the power number doesn't change and from this equation up here you calculate viscosity. Now this makes online viscometer. That's basically what it is. You're taking data of a production line you're using it to calculate the viscosity of the material you're processing. Now that's uh, really a spectacular concept. It was first envisioned, I think, in 1956. I think the chap was Magnus over in uh, Sweden or Denmark. Manufacturers should have their MP data on their equipment. Maybe yes, maybe no. And obviously, uh, viscosity is the most important common quantity in laminar processing, creeping flow processing. The transition regime is between laminar and turbulent flow from 1 to 5,000. Lots of problems operate, excuse me, lots of processes operate in the transition regime. It's also known as a problem regime. There's lots of problems in the transition regime. You want to avoid these if you can. In the transition regime, both density and viscosity are important. Data are contradictory and unnecessarily clear. Power measurements should be measured. If you try to use correlations to calculate power, you could probably assume they're just that uh, unreliable. You can assume that you know you've got to do this calculation, but uh, if you're may not give you reliable results, however. Closing comments, it's important to understand how power is distributed in, power, distributed in the process, how and where the power is dissipated. The shear rates vary spatially in the tank. That means viscosity varies in the tank. Common solution uh, is to have a low to moderate shear rate applied uniformly throughout the tank. These shear rates will be above the mill point for Bingham plastic and below the solidification shear rates of a shear thickening fluid. And then here's some questions for you. Scale of scrutiny needs to be a part of product specifications. It's true. Shear rates are near, the important shear rates are near and around the impeller blade. That's true. The headstrong number is like a processing switch, and that's true as well. Questions, true, true, true. And let's go on to laminar processing. What we just went through was perhaps uh, for pace, somewhat for pace, but also for viscous liquids. Let's go on and explain the process here. And mixing, you're creating an interfacial area, basically. The surfaces are extended, area diffusion is created. What you're really doing is redistribution and reorientation. Okay, redistribution of the materials, how it's distributed as it flows, reorientation, you're reproducing it for the next pass. So if I go and look at my picture here, excuse me, my picture here is right here. I am experiencing different shear rates, and as I have different shear rates, it's being spread out. Actually, this is one shear rate. Actually, it's not. It's an uh, increasing shear rate as I go down. So the slope of the line is changing. So, or I have a chunk of fluid here that approaches the wall, and this is the wall down here, and you can think of this chunk of fluid getting stretched. The x-axis is elongated and the y-axis is shrunk. So at each one of those, I'm stretching out the interface and producing new area. New area is this A prime. A zero is the old area as a function of shear rate. S is shear rate. Now then, when I start, I've done one shear rate. And, oh, 
I've done one charade, then I reorientated, charade it again, so it's no longer S, but it's S squared, and I do it again, it's S cubed, S eventually gets to S and N, so I'm shearing orientation, shearing orientation, shearing orientation, so on and so on, so what happens, here's the concept. I have the original cube, it's cut, cube here, it's cut, it's reorientated by restacking, it's elongated, and then I take a portion of that, which now becomes that, and this repeats over and over and over again. Stopping and starting is actually highly effective and very efficient. And so you stop and stop, you change it somewhat. How you feed is also very important. Right? If I feed right here, uh, first off, let me explain the mixer. The mixer, you have the outer wall here. And the mixer is fairly simple. It's just a simply a rotating cylinder inside, or vice versa. And I feed right here, and the feed goes back on itself. So I'm not getting very good mixing at all. However, see, this is the result. However, now if I feed across here, basically what happens is I have a lot of surface area being generated here. So I can take a very bad mixer and change how it's being fed, and uh, I get good results. I.e., feeding is extremely important. You need to pay attention to feeding. Various uh, mixers, I list them as winners and losers. The loser mixer would be the anchor and collar down there. You see it everywhere, and everybody uses it. I would use the mixer on the left, very left, the double helical ribbon with bottom scraper. However, I would remove these arms here, and I would take the anchor and put the double helix on this anchor. And when I do that, I need no arms and mount it on the anchor. It leaves me with lots of places to come in from the head and with my process measurements. This is perhaps a, this one here, the double helix, is perhaps, especially on a ribbon, is perhaps a, a universal mixer. This thing looks impressive, but the inner screw may be actually not doing much at all. The inner screw may actually be a hindrance to the outer pumping of the ribbon. I have a single ribbon, that's not, that's not good. Single ribbon, not good. Sport arms are pain in the neck, don't use them. If I use turbulent mixers and laminar application without planetary mix, uh, without planetary motion, I am likely to have well mixed caverns around the impeller and the rest of the tank is stagnant. And turning up the RPM doesn't eliminate these cavities. So the important problem here is don't use turbulent mixers in a laminar application. There will be some people who will try that, but uh, they'll have an awful lot of processing problems. The, the process may become very delicate. Anger and power, pretty bad. Actually, it lifts the fluid off the wall and puts it back. <laughs> or axial flow. There's no axial flow up here. There's no real surface renewal at the wall. Importance to heat transfer is exaggerated. Sold as a heat transfer type thing. What you really need is wall wipes and you need an angle, which means wall wipes on a helix. Right? There is flow down here. You got a huge impeller down here. It's very good. So you have mixing at the bottom of the anchor in here, but the top is a fairly stagnant area. High shear rates occur between the blade and the wall. You've already seen that, right? Axial circulation actually depends upon a secondary circulation. You have primary circulation down here that may generate an opposite flow at the top. Should have helices mounted on the blades. Anchor color should have helices anchored on the blades. Helical ribbon, really great. I have good processing design, good axial mixing, much better in the anchor. 
two impalers with bottom scrapers and if you notice you have a dead zone here I don't know if you can see it or not you have flow going down and flow slowly rising and spiral on the outside it's pumping upward but there is a region in here where you have essentially a dead zone the dead zone is here would be approximately zero velocity so at point six radius off 0.6 radius of the total I have velocities going to zero and I have a dead zone zero velocity is bad news so these give you the velocity profile in a helical ribbon much like you would expect uh, velocity profiles for anything you have here the fluid being pumped up in the center and being pulled down the wall it's a uh, pumping up the impeller uh, is pumping pulling the liquid down velocities for a helical ribbon pumping downward helical screw as opposed to helical ribbon very good axial circulation good design little is known about the flow field trap tubes generally uh, don't do much except what trap tubes do is it reduces any variations it reduces the standard deviation in something you may have mixing time say you have a mixing time of 40 minutes but you don't know the standard deviation so i have a 40 minute mix time standard deviation of 10 minutes however i, I throw in a heat uh, trap tube now what will happen is I'll have a mix time of still 40 minutes, but the standard deviation may be two. So that's why I essentially draft tubes do. Uh, draft tubes are basically, uh, well, I guess the best, best way of explaining draft tubes is get online, type in draft tubes, and you'll see a whole bunch. Uh, helical cones uh, with clearances can be varied. That's kind of an interesting concept. Axial pumping, the materials pumped against the tank bottom, causes uh, lots of reorientation and redistribution. Bingham plastics, the solid uh, below the yield point, what happens is you'll get on and off, on again, off again behavior. And viscoelastic fluids uh, may need special handling, especially if the elasticity is important to you. There's substantial numerical simulations of flow patterns out there. Calculation of the helical ribbon is no problem at all, so you can generate a whole bunch of information. The information can't necessarily be measured or visualized, so shear stress and energy dissipation. Now, you got the flow field, right? So, we are quite fine with you, you know everything. So is the problem solved? Is the engineering solved? No, 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 no. Just because you know everything doesn't mean first that you understand everything. You may know it, but you may not understand it. Second point is you may not understand what's important. You should only focus on things that are important. Right. Obviously, studying horses today in this modern era of cars makes you sort of a specialized item anyway circulation times is kind of interesting rule of the thumb you're looking for seven to forty revolutions to circulate you drop in a little foam pellet and let it disappear and see how how long it takes to reappear and that will be the circuit the circulation time and you can possibly estimate the mixing time by taking seven times the circulation time Ineffective designs are everywhere. Ineffective designs are everywhere. Inadequate processing designs, for example, turbulent mixes in a laminar, laminar application. Increasing RPM won't solve the problem. Inadequate uh, John equipment is used everywhere. And it's good because this gives us processing problems and a lot of job security. Large-scale processing will be impractical or impossible. Processing objectives will be difficult or impossible to accomplish. That's pretty difficult. 
you're trying to uh, pound a nail in the wall and you have a screwdriver. <laughs> Obviously, pounding in the wall needs a hammer, not a screwdriver. You're trying to put a screw in the wall, you can't really do that with a hammer. You need a screwdriver, right? So different processing requires different pieces of equipment. What you're looking for also is effective processing geometries. They're usually the starting point. If you get the mixing wrong, then everything else is wrong. Mixing allows the process to unfold. Right? Uh, you're usually looking for 80 revolutions to mix. Processing is easy when you have an effective mixing geometry. You have feller diameter should be probably 0 0.95 tank diameter. Most versatile works well in turbulent regimes. It's very important to recognize. Turbulent geometries do not work well in laminar, laminar situations. Laminar geometries work excellent in turbulent flow. Jets, liquid jets, you put water, put water in a glass under a sink, right? You'll see it very well mixed. But that type of jet mixing doesn't happen in laminar flow or creeping flow. It's quite different than uh, turbulent flow, creeping flow is. For processing, usually you'll have high power input, very poor fluid motion, and you may have caverns. Here's the uh, whipped cream experiment. These caverns can't be mixed away, right? Where's my caverns? Do I have caverns? The changes in design or other methods, add more impellers, use recommended mixing geometry, laminar mixing geometry. This is the helical ribbon. Typically, the homogenization uh, number, or the HO number, typically you're looking between 30 and 150. The units is uh, only at this homogenization number, the number of revolutions to mix. Only a function of geometry for the most part. Laminar processing, you can have a significant temperature rise, temperature changes, the viscosity level, power and flow changes, power measurements can be used to determine viscosity. Temperature rises may require downstream cooling. Here's some uh, data from Nagata. I don't know if you realize who Nagata was, but in 1956 or so, when this original data was taken, Nagata was at the University of Kyoto doing much better research than anything in the entire world. <laughs> that includes the United States. Mixing in the United States is notoriously poorly understood. Universal mixer, this is fantastic. Because usually uh, the question is what uh, what happens when I change viscosity? So as viscosity changes, I move along this Reynolds number range down here. If I take a look, I have a helical ribbon and I see the performance. This is the number of, this curve here is for the number of revolutions to mix. So in this region, which is turbulent roughly, I have 40 revolutions to mix. Over here, I may have 60 revolutions to mix. So I have excellent mixing in laminar flow, excellent mixing in turbulent flow. Then I go through this transition bump, basically which, uh, as I pointed out, the transition regime is the problem regime. You're not quite sure what's happening here. You have a situation where the process physics become very complex. And the number of revolutions to mix may be getting up around 300. So this adds job security problem, processing problems, job security. And people are not recognizing this as a problem and they encounter it and they don't understand it. So that's good. That's good. Good for us. Now then, where does that data come from? That's kind of an interesting point. Well, mixing time ought to vary with uh, the volume you're trying to mix divided by impeller pumping. That's the first thing you should recognize. Impeller pumping is n cubed, nd cubed, and the volume is t cubed, roughly. Just T is the tank diameter, and you're running a square batch. Liquid height and diameter are the same, so it's called a square batch. So I have volume divided by impeller pumping. 
then I cross multiply by rotational speed here. So over on the left half side, I have number of revolutions to mix. On the right half side, all I have is geometry. Now I can start changing liquid height, which would change the T. I could change the number of blades or the blade width, which would change this. But the number of revolutions to mix is a function of geometry. Okay, I'm not sure if I, my light went out over here. Okay, so we're continuing on. Processing time is not fixed, varies with uh, volume and impeller pumping. Individual tanks can be calibrated. Make a small addition, record how long it takes, that will give you your mixing time, right? And then you note the, what rotational speed you were at, and then you do the multiplication and get the end data. Processing is easy and effective geometries. All bets are off with ineffective processing geometries. Ineffective processing geometries can be made effective by proper feeding. Other impellers, you can have the intermig, sigma mixer, back and forth mixers, planetary, and uh, no impeller mixes viscoelastic material as well. Maybe yes, maybe no. A colleague of mine, very smart fellow, says that he can mix viscous, vis viscoelastic materials without destroying the viscous, viscoelasticity. I would believe him since he's a very smart fellow. Laminar uh, designs perform satisfactorily and recommended. Fairland designs do very poorly and are not recommended. Transition regimes poorly. There's a regime of poor processing more often than not. Objectives, low power, good distribution of power, good fluid motion, viscosity increases, power draw will also increase. Laminar processing may require substantial power levels, and that really could possibly be temperaturized and also changes the viscosity. Large viscous reactors do not mix with turbulent geometries. Anyway, common problems for most laminar impellers, the presence of a standing toroidal vortices. There's no mechanisms to break these things up. Pumping in shear blade, uh, pumping in blade shear do not necessarily affect these vortices. Processing into these systems is by diffusion. Diffusion is very slow. Now, what's really interesting is one way of getting around this poor situation is you stop and start, stop and start. That helps an awful lot. If you stop, start, stop, and then you reverse directions on the next start, that even helps better. If you look at your washing machine at home, you'll see washing machine will be dealing with clothes, which is probably a viscous system. There's a whole bunch in there. And they go back, the washing machine typically goes back and forth. Processing miscible liquids? Hmm. Well, let's see if we got the data on that. There you go. Now then, one of the interesting things is you again have Reynolds number going from, say, 1,000 down to 0.01. You have uh, three regimes in here, and quite basically, quite frankly, grind lots of information. Up here, you're running different volume ratios, different volume ratios. Here, you also have differences in viscosity between fluid A and fluid B. You're missing, mixing two miscible liquids with their varying different physical properties. And I wouldn't get too carried away with this. I would just say anything. I can usually mix below a, a thousand revolutions. That's what I would do with the say. Yeah, I got my 50 revolutions here, but uh, anyway, just as a rule of thumb, if I have a good mixing geometry, I can expect to mix below a uh, thousand revolutions. That's very helpful, sort of a rule of thumb, right? So 40,000 uh, revolutions to mix different regimes. Mix while adding and filling is also a good idea. Wall adhesion is difficult to overcome, and don't feed at the wall. Right? Difficult to mix because of elasticity, uh, keeps the shape, returns the shape after shear. 
the larger tanks may be structurally, not structurally the same, and the flow dominates the elastic behavior. And taller makes those fluid recoils. Very nice diagram, 1985 by the Japanese. As I said, the Japanese know a lot. America knows very little. Ha <laughs> Anyway, let's see how far up. Let's see how far we are away from the end. We're not very far away from the end. Okay, going back to viscoelastic materials. Viscoelastic materials do not behave like Newtonians. They oftentimes act in the opposite direction. Flows may segregate into zones. Toyota vortices may actually form and difficult to mix. You should calculate the Weisenberg number, which has the normal stress, rotational speed, and viscosity. Now then, you take a look at this normal stress thing. It's zero shear first normal stress difference coefficient. So I get one, two, three, four, five, six. Six words to describe one physical property. So I know I am in a high tech area when I have to have six terms in the name. Ooh, a Heisenberg, a famous Heisenberg uh, phenomena. You'll find that uh, impellers are generally ineffective at processing viscosity or viscoelastic materials. The viscosity uh, is destroyed by the mixing. So what I would do is I mix first and then create the elasticity. It's probably a better way of processing. Anyway, uh, mixing and circulation times increase almost in, almost increases by an order of magnitude. So mixing times increase by a factor of three with a Heisenberg number of uh, seven. Pumping capacities will go down by that much. So here is the pumping of a uh, fluid and up here is the pumping of a viscoelastic fluid. So you have a significant reduction in axial pumping up here. Down here is my viscoelastic fluid. Oh, uh, here is my viscoelastic fluid. Right? Here's my Newtonian. And you can see that the mixing times are definitely uh, increased significantly. Let's finish up here with these questions. The number of revolutions to determine uh, to mix determine the mixing time. True. Different geometries have different uh, number of revolutions mixed. True. Transition regime is probably the most difficult regime. True. Uh, turbulent mixers don't work well in laminar applications. True. Let's close it off now. Again, this was a uh, Recording for uh, particle class uh, dealing with uh, chemical equation 470 and uh, 670. This is March uh, 14th, I think, uh, 2016, is it? I thank you for your attention, and we will continue to pursue these lectures this way for the next couple of sessions. So I will stop, and I hope you all have a wonderful day.